Not here, we'll start. Or we won't. Uh, let's start with our roll call. Sheena Martinez, District 1. Uh, Paul Carey for District 2. Bill King, District 3. Harold Stein, District 4. Herb Dyer, District 5. And Darren schroeder Mayor. we all here. All right, please rise with me for the Pledge of Allegiance and uh, please remain standing for the invocation after that. Starting with the American flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America 
and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And now the Texas flag. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state, under God, one and indivisible. And we have Pastor Matt from Discover Church. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness, your mercy, and most of all, your grace. We're saved by your grace. We thank you for that. Today, we ask that you will be part of this meeting, that you will give encouragement, peace, and strength through this meeting, that you will uh, encourage these council members to act with integrity, with character, and that they will find the best solutions for this community. We're thankful for them. We pray blessings over them and over this community. In Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next item is uh, citizens' comments. Would anybody like to speak for citizens' comments? <laughs> Would anybody except for Arnie? <laughs> Just kidding, Arnie, sorry. He's kidding. I'm kidding. I didn't even hear what he said, but I was <laughs> a material like yesterday. <laughs> I'm used to it. Uh, Arnie DeLossi, 109 River Bluff. I'm just here to kind of give you a real quick, short summary of Tour de Casterville. That was April 1st. Uh, everything went well. Weather was great. People had fun. On our portion, meaning the city of Casterville, Tour de Casterville, that we've been doing off and on now for the 12 years. We had 302 participants. It's way up from two years ago when the COVID hit and the colder weather and everything. Uh, out of that, as far as numbers, there were 89 that did the 5K, 40 people that did the 10K, 94 that did the 30 mile, and 75 that did the 60 mile. Uh, so it's 302 people that registered through a new business that we use this year called Athlete Guild, which is out of New Braunfels versus Active.com that we would used the other 11 years. Um, we had rest stops, two in town here for the Walker Runners, one by Houston Square, one up at River Bluff, and two for the cyclists one in Lacoste and one what I referred to as out in the boonies. It's actually on two county roads in Bear County in the Atascosa City zip code. So it's like nine miles past Lacoste. And then we have the park obviously with all that. Uh, there's going to be a half page ad go in the Hondo Anvil newspaper Thursday thanking everybody that's been sponsors this year. A lot of the volunteers. I think we got everybody's name in there, all kinds of things with it. In addition, for about the last four years now, we've had the Pathfinders American Volk Sport Association Club, AVA, out of San Antonio participate with us both in marking the walk run route as well as manning the two rest stops for us. They had 79 participants in addition and they had 14 volunteers that helped mark the streets and do their own registration and everything down at the park uh, and all kinds of other volunteers that will be in the ads. Uh, we're going to have a wrap-up meeting Thursday and I still am waiting on a few bills and stuff to come in but for the money coming in for registration and everything it'll be the most we've ever had. Uh, the city got noticed the other day of ten thousand one hundred ninety six dollars and seven cents that will be coming in that goes into the special account for parks and that's pretty much it uh, we'll just give more information there'll be an article and there was an article in the paper the other day the thank you ad and then once everything kind of gets wrapped up if there's a need I'll just come back and give some more information but thanks for your guys support and gals support as well I shouldn't say guys <laughs> I'll hear from my councilwoman Anyway, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Arnie. Yeah, uh, Councilman yeah. Kerry did the 60 mile, correct? No, 30. Thank 30, 30 mile. He did the 30 mile. I gave you a lot of credit. Uh, <laughs> back back in the saddle. Yeah. I, I, haven't been, I haven't been on the bike as much this year. So well, good for you. And then Kerry and I did the 10, uh, the 10K. It was, 
it was great, uh, as always, really well put on. I want to say that the uh, second rest stop out in the Boonies was only about a quarter mile from the four dogs in the road. So. <laughs> <laughs> he went fast. And those got taken care of by the constable from precinct two. Nice. <laughs> All right, would anybody else like to talk uh, for citizens' comments? All right, great. Uh, so we're going to start getting into this. Uh, one of the things I, I just want to kind of put an introduction. We're going to get into the consent agenda. Um, we've got a lot of stuff that's going on uh, in Castorville right now. One of the things you'll notice about this uh, council is um, they have been very, very proactive in making sure that things are done. There's a lot of things that have been deferred maintenance for years and some for decades. Uh, they've been very, very proactive in getting a lot of these things done. We are spending money. Um, we are doing that incredibly carefully. Our fund balances are larger than they ever have been. We have a double A rating, uh, which is incredible for a city this size. A lot of that double is double A plus. Double yep. A plus, pardon me, double A plus. Uh, and part of that is because I think um, the the leadership from the, the council, the leadership from our city administrator and from our, our finance director and with our department heads, really looking at where do they spend money wisely, efficiently, so, um, We've been, they have managed our money really, really well. They've been great stewards of our money. So I just want to introduce that because we are talking about spending more money. Uh, this is all money that we have. We're not a rich city, but we're a very well-run city. Uh, and this is part of what we're going to be talking about today. So on the consent agenda, uh, we have four items. Minutes for March 28th, 2023, regular called city council meeting. We have approved ordinance amending FY 2022-23 budget general and enterprise funds, uh, approve K-Freeze task order for professional services for engineering and design for streets and utility improvements, and the uh, FY 23-24 budget calendar. Do I have a motion? I'd like to take uh, item A, I've got an administrative collection to it. Okay. Take it off the consent agenda, unless you want me just to cover the administrative correction. Uh, we'll just take that off the consent agenda and handle it on the other. Can you take item C off? Uh, do you want to? We can we can discuss that, and then determine if we need to take it off. No. Okay. Uh, no. Okay. To discuss. So we'll remove A and C. Anybody else? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Nice. All right, so we have two items left. Uh, do we have a motion on those? I move that we approve items B and D of the consent agenda as posted. And I'll second. Great. Any discussion? Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passes. All right, so then we're going to move to the minutes for uh, March 28, 2023, where we called city council meeting. And the changes you have there are uh, item 8. Uh, the City Council Board liaison reports that the eighth line down it says Councilman Dyer was unable to attend the Parks and Recreation Board meeting. I did attend that meeting, so it just needs to be corrected to show I was there. Okay, did you catch that, Deborah? Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, with that modification, do I have a motion to approve? So moved. All right, second. Great. In discussion, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion passes. Okay. Uh, next item is approve K-Freeze task order for professional services for engineering and design for streets and utility improvements. So we have discussion on this. Um, me? Yes, please. Oh, and just for your information, uh, Leroy put up a basically a clip. Uh, I put together kind of a map based on what they had said, where the different items were. Everything in green are the streets uh, that uh, that we're talking about working on in that task order uh, that are as line items in there, and then the water line replacement uh, down Alamo and San Jacinto is in the blue, if you can see the colors. Um, and no way from K3 is here, right? Yes. yes. Oh, my! You're hiding. <laughs> I didn't see, sorry. You all, uh, this is the Berlin Street, basically. A continuation of, of what you all did in Berlin, correct? Yes, that's right. Um, Good evening, everybody. 
the, the, the system that's envisioned is very similar concept, cement stabilization of the existing material, kind of mix in the existing roadbed, cement stabilize it so we get a stronger base to build the road on. And then there's been some improvements in the, the methodology for the chip seal uh, surface. We're not finished with that. We're talking to a lot of contractors. I mean, in fact, I had lunch today with TxDOT's uh, pavement specialist to talk further about it. We're looking at, again, at a two-course chip seal, trying to optimize the rock size. We're going to go with trap rock, which is kind of out of the Canipa plant. So there's some pros and cons to it, but I think overall it'll be better for the city. Um, and then probably do a, a fog seal over the top of that once we're done to kind of lock it in. It's going to give it a, like a nice black look. And it's also going to help uh, lock in some of that. Uh, there's always a little bit of loose rock that's going to finish locking that in. Dust and aggregate. Yeah. So we're just, and then by going with the trap rock, we'll get we'll reduce some of that dust because it won't be limestone rock. It'll be more of a igneous type rock. And you all in your proposal, you kind of estimate one and a half visits per week. Is that about what? Could you all did the inspection like that in Berlin Street? Yeah, the, to be clear, so like the, it's an interesting distinction. So as the engineers, we're going to come out about once. We'll come out once for the construction meetings. We'll come out once additionally just to make sure that the general conformance with the specs and plans. Is it being built the way we had envisioned it? Make sure we're coordinating with the contractor and keeping things running smoothly. The city has asked us to provide some on-site inspection which we've done um, through one of our inspectors, a guy with like 40 years of heavy civil construction experience as a contractor and an inspector. So he provided some assistance for Alsatian Oaks. He provided some assistance on Lafayette. In fact, for a brief period there, he was the kind of the, the de facto city inspector when you were in between inspectors. Um, so the one and a half visits a month is sort of just an average. It's an opportunity to help grow the city's inspection staff capabilities and then serve as that bridge, right? The city only has one inspector and he can't be everywhere. So that's an opportunity to provide a little additional oversight over some key elements of the project. And then the idea is sort of directed at, at John and Devin's um, requirements. So if early on, in my mind, I envision it maybe a little heavier at the beginning. And then as once we kind of feel like we have the contractor is doing the things the way we expected them to go and the city's inspector is comfortable with the chip seal process, that might scale off if, if the city staff wanted it to back off at the end. So that's why it's listed as a supplemental service. So we'll. If we use it, we pay the hour. If we don't use it, we don't use it. And, and that was not on Berlin Street. Yeah, Berlin was that we were doing some inspection, but we didn't have full time inspection in this way. We did some, but not quite the same scale. So the one and a half times per week is incorporated in your proposal or your estimated cost, but it, it may go above that, it may go below that. But it, it, it could, could right? Yeah, we did, and the, the one and a half was so we could, it works out to one and a half, of, so it's like six times a month on average, right? right? Just as a general placeholder, right? And then you don't need geotechnical services. What we're envisioning is we're going to get some geotechnical to do some, basically get some proctors at the beginning of the test, at the beginning, let's sample some, confirm base thickness, get that optimum, which they have to do anyway. They'd have to, even if we come up with a design, we know it's going to be about three to 4% cement is kind of typical. We'll get some proctors on every street test it, say, okay, optimum moisture, or optimum moisture and cement for this street is X based on the, the native the in situ material, rather, right. and then the contractor will go from there. So, right. not a real big, so basically just looking at the base material that you're going to modify. Right. And then, and then we could, what we did on Berlin is there was, and I would envision the same thing as the city would have the QA or quality assurance testing, have the geotechnical firm confirm that you're getting the strength that we're expecting out of that base material just as a check. You know, the contractor should be doing their work and doing a good job, but it's always good to have additional oversight. Because even when, sometimes when the contractor does everything right, he still misses something, right? They're just, it happens, so it's good yeah. to beat extra layers. Yeah, and you all look at, and, and I think specifications, there's a density on the cement modified material when they're putting it down, and that's what they're kind of testing. They're testing for strength, if I'm not mistaken. I think the, I don't, I don't think we finalize the specs on that. We're really close, but like there's some, you can do ordinary compaction control or we could specify a density, and I just don't think we've got to that. 100% yet, but we're working our way towards something that's very clear in the specs for the contractor. And Terracon was doing that last time, so that's we can right. kind of look at what they did last time. Is it expanded to these? That's the, the, that's the concept. I think the cement stabilization went well yeah. the last time, and the, the area for improvement was just trying to optimize that, that ship seal. Yeah. I know it's been early on, but really they was, that Berlin has performed very well, yeah. realizing the dusting problem and some of the, the the, uh, the oil's come to the yeah, yeah. Chip seal works really well on long highways where you can close the lane. Yeah. 
in a residential neighborhood where you have to maintain access to residents, that is, is a challenge. And I think some of the contractors try to mitigate some of the bleeding of oil by putting extra rock in, which actually creates some dust problems when they break against one yeah. another, and it creates some, some bleeding pro problems actually. So that's one of the things we're going to try to do is encourage the contractors to use less rock, trust the process. And, and that should help lock in the rocks. And the, just so you guys know, the, one of the things about a fog seal in a residential neighborhood is that we need that to cure. And so we're going to be coordinated with the city staff to try to alert residents ahead of time. And so we do that fog seal. We can try to keep traffic off it for a few hours to help so that it's not tracking. They have some improved products that they call them tackless and trackless. And they're, the manufacturers do their best to make sure the vehicles don't pick them up. But a lot of these are oil-based products or have oil mixed in with water. And so they, they can get tracked on vehicles. So try to allow the process to work out as best we can. <clears throat> what was your construction estimate? We are finally in that, Phil, um, but I, we're around five, five million, five. six million. And one of the things that uh, we feel like we have good budget on the streets, just based on what the, the city's water sewer budget was, we're envisioning some alternatives where we might not be able to take water replacement up San Jacinto as far as we'd like, depending on the budget availability. That's something we're just going to evaluate. So we've kind of got set up as an all, some alternatives so that the city can see what the real numbers are and then make a decision that says, okay, yeah, we can find the funds for those, or okay, we're going to have to do a future project to pick up that extra five, six blocks or ten blocks, whatever the math does there. We do feel like it's, it's borderline. That's why we kind of propose the alternatives. I mean, that's a substantial <laughs> amount of streets there when you actually look at mm -hmm. percentage-wise, and it doesn't look like a lot, but it really is. So, uh, okay, we'll look at some more questions. I appreciate that. Okay. Sure. Okay, I've got a few. Yes, ma'am. Uh, River Bluff is getting ready to kick off a huge electrical project. And you have Geneva with Ranchero and uh, Chateau, that square there. That's where they're going to be staging the materials and doing underground electrical and everything. So I thought we were holding off that area until after electrical was done. Is that the case? Uh, not necessarily. <laughs> okay, because I mean, I just saw Tom and the contractor, and they were showing me where they're look where they're right in that area is where they're going to stage the materials. Well, it's not confirmed yet. But. Well, that's the only real optional place that that we've got. But they wouldn't be staging in the right of way, though, right? They'd be staging on private property adjacent to. No, it's a green belt. <clears throat> but it's, it's not in the street itself, though, right? It, there's no really off-beaten path type thing. They're going to be on the roads no matter what with their equipment and everything going all around in that area. Well, there would be some, so we do have requirements for, for sequencing, for coordination with other ongoing work. Okay. And maintaining access. One of the things that we've, and we're still working through in some details, like we're, because of old Highway 90 and Geneva and Jackson, not late, you can't work on all those at one time because right. it, there's, we need to allow people to, ways to get around. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And so coming up with some of that exact specific sequencing requirements. And we were trying to, there's a future project to go into River Bluff to do street and utility improvements in River Bluff. And we're, we were waiting until after the electrical work was done. And so we felt like kind of getting up to Ranchero was sort of the. Well, that, but that's where, <laughs> like I said, that's where they're looking at staging the materials. And also, is this going to go over the bridge? Is the, oh, there's the, the chip bridge. work. Um, because there's a bridge the right there on Geneva mm -hmm. going up to the intersection of Geneva and yeah. Washington. That four way yeah. stop sign, there's that bridge there. So, oh, like the Garcia okay. Creek Bridge? Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. And uh, I'm, off the top of my head, I feel like we skipped over the bridge section. I'm trying to remember the specifics. There's, there are some drainage improvements that need to be done mm -hmm. for, for I, we believe, and I'd have to talk to A.B. because he's more in the weeds, but I, I believe that issue is more of an erosion of the downstream channel than is a complete culvert replacement there. Um, but I, the stuff we're doing is very low cost from an investment perspective. Like if, okay. if you had to tear out all the culverts and everything, you'd be kind of <coughs> breaking into that area anyway. Okay. I think the way that we're going to do this, if I'm if I'm correct, uh, between John and Devin and, and you guys, you'll bring it back to us before it actually happens, um, because we need to make sure that we handle communication better. Um, oh, we, that, is, that was just today. What's that? We, we haven't confirmed the state here. Oh no! Oh, well, no, 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 they've, they've looked Over. at all the backyards, uh, and that's the only real thing they're talking. They're going to talk with Dr. Best to see if Dr. Best will allow them to put it on there. But otherwise, they were looking at the green area. That's right there because that's the only option. And we're, we're getting a little bit in the weeds here. Okay. So but these I'm, are good I'm things to look out for. Absolutely. Good things to work out for, look out for. Uh, and so just please make sure that you bring that to us ahead of time. Uh, I want to see the, uh, the communications anyway. 
uh, just because we, we found some opportunities for better communications. There are a few things that you guys are doing like incredibly well. I want to make sure that we're continuing that. The stuff with the AMI, great job. Um, so uh, we just will make sure that we coordinate that as we go forward. Okay. Uh, other questions, concerns? All right. Do I have a motion then? I make a motion to approve K3 staff store for professional services for engineering design for streets and utilities improvement. Second. I'm sorry, who seconded that? Okay. Did I have a second? Yeah. That's McCary. Right, well, I started to, but I thought I heard him say it. So I'll, right. I'll take a second. Who's got a second? All right. <laughs> Council McCary has a second. Uh, any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. Great. Thank you. All right. Thank Welcome. you. All right, next we have a Teams meeting. Uh, next item is a presentation slash update on AMI Smart Meter Project with Amoresco. Uh, and before we get into this, I just want to, I, I mentioned this a second ago, great job on getting that communication out. Um, we've got it out on social media, kind of explaining what's going on with this. Um, and there are some other items that we'll talk about, making sure that we've got our frequently asked questions Please make sure that you give that feedback to Scott. If you have, I sent some additional things that I think we need to cover. Uh, if you have any additional concerns, um, please make sure you read through these, uh, the frequently asked questions that they've got. If you think of any other ones that we need to make sure that we're getting in front of, if you're getting questions from people, let's get those out on there so that we can continue to improve that list. All right, so for this, uh, we have, is it hey, Zach? Uh, Zach, are you online? Yes, can I hear you? Yes. There you go, nice. Can everybody see my screen as well? Yes. Yes. All right, great. Good. Are you all ready for me? Or do you all have anything else that you all need to, to put out before? No, you're Please. good to go. Go ahead and start. Okay. Hi, buddy. Um, oh, sorry. My camera was off right there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> expect and what we're what we're looking at and again thank you very much for accommodating me remotely today I, I truly do appreciate it all right this is the overview of the project um, we're looking at so you were gonna have a uh, series of water meters uh, gas registers as well as um, electric meters that are going to be replaced across the city um, we're integrating this with a new census um, analytics system, which is going to be able to do all the billing and readings uh, remotely um, from the system. You have uh, two uh, gateways that will cover the entire city that is getting the radio reads um, um, for all the all the different uh, meters. And you're also going to be getting a customer portal, which I'll go over in a second, um, where residents and customers will be able to see their uh, consumption um, online and, and be able to track their track their usage. This is our two gateways, and basically what these are, these are antennas, and one of them is at the top of your cross hill tank, and one of them is at the top of the, the water tank um, at the Medina High School, oh. Medina Valley High School, and every uh, meter we're putting in, water, gas, electric, is coming with a radio on it, and it's gonna feed up to this gateway. This gateway then feeds into the, um, the census analytics system and your billing software, and is able to remotely populate and send out um, send out the bills. Um, these all have cellular backup on them, so or cellular service copies are all providing, um, providing the data. Uh, these have been up since about March um, of last year, and we've already tested these out and know they're all, all working and the test meters are going well and feeding right into the system. Um, you have a custom portal coming up as well. It's going to be a one-stop shop for the residents and customers where uh, they can see their gas, electric, and water um, online. You can set up for email, text, and alerts. Um, it'll minimize uh, you know, some routine calls that might get coming into utility billing. Um, with these, with whenever you do a customer portal on projects, uh, we like to get the majority of the project installed first because we want to make sure that any, any kinks are worked out with um, the building software and our data integration. So there's a lot of software technical 
mechanism in which this all are working. So we try to do a, a um, kind of a soft launch um, before we introduce it to everybody. So um, members of the council have been volunteer to maybe be the guinea pigs <laughs> to test out this system uh, or this product first. So um, about when we're about 75% through the installation of the project, we'll do a, like I said, a soft launch and we'll pick a handful of uh, customers to, uh, to use this. So once we have these meters installed, they'll start uh, populating that data uh, into the system. So you'll have some background data already in there so you can see some previous consumption and usage. Everything looks good, um, you know, everyone uh, likes it. Then we do a full launch, we don't do any tweaking on how it's populating. Then we do a full launch um, at the at right end of the project and open it up to the, to the city. Um, our project schedule, uh, so we had our kickoff uh, last week. We're starting out on Monday. Coming up, we'll have our subcontractor, RTS, out there um, getting mobilized on Monday and start putting meters in the ground. Um, uh, Tuesday morning, they might get one or two done Monday, but really start getting the ground running on Tuesday. Uh, we have about an eight to nine week installation period for the water and gas. They'll be doing those um, together. So the water meter, um, I'll get on the next slide, I'll explain how that works. For our gas installation on the register switches, there won't be any disruption in service um, for just the register change out. And so you won't even know that there was uh, anything done to, the, to that gas, gas meter. The water, I'll walk through on the next slide real quick of how that, that process looks. And then we're getting a later start on the electric meters because uh, they had a longer lead time uh, than the gas and water um, did. And that's about a four-week installation. And we'll have uh, more information put out about how the electric will work once we get closer to that, that late May, early June start date. Um, but we're looking to have this completely done, wrapped it up, signed off, and um, all loose ends tightened up by, by August. Um, so real quick, this is a lot of words right here, but this is a great slide to say um, if anybody wants to go back to it. But um, when they come in to do their uh, water meter switch out, they're going to make sure they got the right address, knock on the door. Um, if the resident's not home, then they're going to go to the meter, make sure that meter's not spinning, um, to make sure someone's not in the shower, right, or they're in the back doing laundry or something like that. Um, then once home, meter's not spinning, they'll go ahead and continue with their uh, change out. They'll dig out the pit and replace the uh, box if needed. Um, and then they'll uh, flush out their line when they're done and leave a door hanger and a tag on the uh, on the front door to let the resident know that their water meter had been changed out. If somebody is home, they'll talk to them, briefly explain, hey, your water's gonna be uh, turned off for about 10 to 15 minutes. I'll be on your property for about 20, 25, based on paperwork they have to do on these, um, getting the data um, correct in their, their handhelds as they install them. And then they'll uh, go on and move to the next one. Um, if anyone has any issues or concerns, they don't, you know, they say uh, they're cooking or, you know, whatever, um, that's fine. We'll make a note in our, um, in our book and we'll come back to it at a better time. Um, we'll never, you know, force anybody to have their meter changed out if the time doesn't work, work for them. Um, here's a, a template of the door hanger being left, and we're leaving these once we're, we're done and complete. Um, we weren't able to do anything, um, we'll have to come back to the house, but we're only leaving these door hangers um, to let them know that work had been done um, uh, to their meter. Um, and I know there's also a, um, a newsletter that's going out as well that's explaining this uh, this process as well. Um, the uh, cat, I believe, is going out on this week or next week's um, newsletter. Uh, but we do have it in English and Spanish as well. Um, um, which, which is always helpful. So um, I know that was kind of a lot real quick. Um, I apologize if I talk quickly. I've been pulled up my whole life. But um, if y'all have any any questions in the slide you can go back to or comments or concerns, uh, please let me know and I'll be happy to discuss. I do. Go ahead. I do. Uh, yeah, I have a question uh, in regards to uh, sure. River Bluff. The city on, there's quite a few of them in my neighborhood that they had to put a pressure valve on the city side on the meter because our water pressure fluctuates from 60 PSI to 120 PSI. Who is going to be putting in those new valves, those whatever you call them, at the same time that they're putting in the new meter? 
So you're saying we need to switch out those valves? Well, it's connected to the current meter on the city side. So are you going to be putting that in, or is there going to be a city employee right with you to put those in? So if there's any additional work beyond the meter change, we'll work with utility if that's on that. That's something we can perform as well. Um, additional pressure valves uh, was not. If that's a case by case basis, that we'll work. We'll work with the utility on on how to get that best. I mean, it's definitely something we're capable of doing. It wasn't scoped out originally um, for them. Um, if it's already in there and exists, then that valve would just be turned off when they when they go to switch out the meter, and it, the meter's not going to change the uh, the water pressure. So it's it's just a like for like uh, sizing going in there and the same flow. So if that valve already exists, I don't see how this would necessarily need to be an issue um, with the meter change out. Okay, because it's connect. It's, I don't know how it's connected, but it's connected to the meter on the city side. Yeah, typically that's just an inline. Yeah. It's a, a pipe connected to a. Okay, I'm just making sure because I have cause I have people in my neighborhood asking that question because our pressure fluctuates so bad that the city came back came in and put those on the meters on the city side. Mm. We want to make sure that that stays because we because it was busting pipes in my neighborhood. Right. Yeah. So. Sure. Okay. This, this is River Bluff, correct? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I'm making a note right now, and I'll make sure that when we get to. River Bluff. Um, we, we have a weekly construction meeting with utility as well. So before we go into a route or a neighborhood, we're um, these questions will be brought up. So I'll make sure to put a note right now that when we get there, that RTS is aware that these have these valves uh, attached to the meters, and we'll we'll take care of them. Okay. Thank you. Great. Any other questions? Not a, not a question or comment. I got. I don't know if people know how this is so great. My mother-in-law has property out in the country and every once in a while my brother in law will send me a text message, you need to go out and check something's gone wrong out there because it's using twice as much electricity as it normally is. And daily you can check water and electrical like, this is going to be great for the Senate, for the citizens. It's, it's I don't know if people understand just how great I had a leak in my house for damn there three years. Uh, three different lines I fixed one and I and if I had this three years ago, I'd been thousands of dollars ahead right now. So this is going to be good. I'm excited. Great. Questions, comments? I'm here. Yeah. Well, I think that the communication has been really great, and a couple of the questions that that I had had um, just in addressing this um, were things like, so you're spending all this money on these automatic uh, meter reading. Uh, so is this going to raise our utility bill? And the fact is, uh, it, on the water side, uh, I think Councilman Kerry and I both had uh, examples of failing water meters that were no longer registering correctly or at all. Or at all. Uh, yeah. So there are, we know for a fact that there are a lot of water meters. What do we have? 80%, I think it was, that were end of life, past end of life <laughs> by... <laughs> 86% of... Wait, wait, I'm not going to get free water anymore? 86%. <laughs> so if you've been getting free water, understand you will now start paying for it. And, you know, for, for the people that have been underreporting, it is going to increase not the rate, but it's actually going to be reading the water that you're using. So just be aware. Yes. It'll be accurate. The good thing about that is that uh, we no longer, right now, if the individuals who are being undercharged aren't paying for it, then the rest of us are paying for it. So people will be paying for what they're actually using. Other than that, the rates are staying the same. Um, the city has found great efficiencies in this. The reason that we're doing it right now is because right now we only have the existing city to replace, and uh, we're going to be double that in the next few years, and probably du double that in the next few years beyond that. So this is the right time to get these things in. Uh, and I'm, I'm really excited about this as well. It will probably to uh, Councilman uh, King's point, it will probably save people a lot of money. I think about after the uh, the winter storm, how many people, the cops were driving around and just finding where, where the spurts were going, where the water was running, and so this would actually allow you to, to get alerted on that. So great job. Thank you. That's a great presentation. I appreciate your uh, attention to detail on the communication. Just that one, that third point about Check to see if they're in the shower or <laughs> in the back. That's, uh, that's very, very thoughtful.
Yeah, I mean, I think I've, I've, we've installed, I've done this for many, many years. I've been hundreds of thousands of water meters uh, have gone in. Um, and yet it's, believe me, we don't want to disrupt anybody's day any more than they want us to disrupt them. And we take great caution in making sure that it's an easy and a good time wait time uh, to get these switched out for every, every resident. Great. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you for your time. All right. Thank you. Thank you. No, I said it probably happened at one point. Probably happened at one time. Yes. <laughs> okay, so next item is discussion and appropriate action on approving quiddity task order number three for TxDOT uh, TA bridge project. Uh, I wanted, uh, Lee, will you, will you bring up that presentation that I had on there? No, this is the PowerPoint. I'd send you a PowerPoint as well. Leroy, you don't like our remote or what? Sorry. Hardware uh, uh, you know, works great. You know. So we have Linda from Quiddity here, and uh, she has been just really helping us out with a number of different projects that we've been looking at. We did a presentation uh, to TechSnot um, just a couple of what was it? A couple of weeks ago, there were three different projects that we were exploring. Um, one was for the uh, the Highway 90 bridge. So uh, just for those of you who are not aware, uh, I put together this. Uh, these are all of the images, all of the things that I could find about Highway 90 bridge. So I wanted to make sure that people understand what we're talking about. This is a uh, multimodal bridge, so it would be like a uh, walking, biking, maybe small golf cart kind of bridge uh, that would uh, look like the old one. Do you have the... I think, I think you have this up. Who <laughs> <laughs> oh, pointed at Leroy? <laughs> so if you look at uh, the perspective on this, this is looking at it from the, the Steinbach side. Uh, the Steinbach House side, you can see the uh, the dam there. Uh, so this is the old Highway 90 bridge with the three abutments. The the westernmost is actually in the uh, like the very edge of the Landmark Inn parking lot. Uh, let's go to the next one. Uh, this is a little bit hard to see. If you look at it, uh, north is down, <laughs> south is up, and you can see where it says the big Medina there. That's the Medina River. Uh, and you can see the um, there's a kind of a sweeping uh, double line that is the the hundred foot right of way that they have there at the bridge. Uh, just uh, south of that, just above that, you can see it says um, where is it? Uh, Present Bridge, right above where it says Rock Dam. Mm -hmm. So you can see basically where that was, uh, and then the extension of uh, to the left of where it says Present Bridge, how it goes into the old Highway 90 back behind Sammy's and all of that. So that's, uh, the nice thing is that they moved it over. And so uh, this is something I was talking to Sammy Shearhart about. This is something that he's been wanting to do for a number of years. Uh, and the city was just never able to find the funds for this. TxDOT has this, this funding mechanism, these uh, grants available. And so it's, uh, it, it just seemed like a kind of a perfect no brainer. So this is like a 1940s plan when they built it. Yeah, so this was, yeah, 1940, the, the, uh, on the very first slide, it talks about this one was, the original one was installed, I think, in 1904. Right. And then torn down in, just after 1940 when the new uh, bridge was put in. Uh, I think I had a couple of other um, views of that. Go ahead and go on to the next one. Uh, and this just gives you kind of a better idea of, of where we're talking about. Uh, go on, there you go. There's another view of it. Cool looking bridge. Uh, and then I'll, I'll let Linda talk a little bit about what, how we're going to approach that. Uh, I think there were two more. Yeah, so it's the Transportation Alternatives Program. It actually is uh, set aside specifically for bicycle and pedestrian projects throughout the state. Uh, typically, these funds get administered through local MPOs, but then also TxDOT puts these calls out for anyone who wants to apply throughout the entire state. So we submitted three applications. 
One was for this, the other is for an active transportation plan. So if that gets approved, it would do look at the entire city, trying to find the best ways to connect the community using sidewalks, um, bicycle trails, all of that, right? So really laying out a plan for what that could look like in the community. Um, the bridge here, again, the idea is to provide a safer bicycle and pedestrian crossing. So what you have right now, it's a four foot sidewalks back of curb, right? So as traffic increases on that bridge, it, you, it's really not gonna feel very comfortable walking right next to an 18 wheeler coming by. So this would give you a safe crossing of the river. It also connects two of your historic landmarks. Uh, and hopefully if we do this well, it's going to, to look like what was there before, right? That's the entire goal is to kind of bring back some of that history while also providing a safer connection. Um, right now, it may seem like it's just a little piece, but it's a very critical piece in that crossing of the river. Once we put together the active transportation plan, then we can see how we weave that and tie it into the community, again, using sidewalks and bicycle trails. Um, the third was a project um, to add a shared use path along Lower Lacoste Road. All three have the ability to move forward. And talking with the mayor and your city administrator and after having our meeting with TxDOT, our recommendation is that we move forward with the shared use path bridge, that we maybe hold off on Lower Lacoste Road, right? Uh, because the next step in this process, it's a two-step process. The first was a preliminary application, very simple, two pages, not a whole lot of work, right? The next phase of the detailed application, so at this point what we're trying to accomplish is get a good enough cost estimate so that we, we submit to TxDOT as close as we can get it what this is actually going to cost. And why that's important is that this grant program is a reimbursement program. So if we go in with $3 million and it ends up costing $4 million, then that would mean the city would be on the line for that additional million. Uh, to finish the project. So that's why we're submitting this uh, task order to develop 30% schematics so that we can get you a cost estimate that is gonna put you in a really good situation with text on, make sure it's as accurate as possible. And then, so we're, we're gonna be pursuing the bridge project and the active transportation. And the active transportation plan, but because that's a plan, there's not a whole lot that goes into that. So that application is actually almost complete, the detailed application for that. And the reason that we, that we held off on the lower Lacoste Road is because um, trying to get that coordinated, uh, you'd have to get it coordinated with all of the property owners, with all of the right of way, with all of the drainage. And uh, we were concerned that we wouldn't have enough time to get all that done. Uh, and I think it's a better thing to do after we've done the active transportation plan so that we can start prioritizing. I think it's important Correct. that we get these different um, items in, but we get them defined, then we get them prioritized, and then we'll find funding. Yeah. We'll have other opportunities. Once you have this jewel in place, I think the rest of it will be an easier sell. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, and the really exciting part is that TechStop was excited about this project. So they were they were excited about this project. You know, um, I think the TPD director said, you know, out of the 20 projects that we've reviewed as part of this process, this is my favorite so far. So um, that's not a guarantee. That's not a guarantee no. by any means. No. <laughs> um, but when you compared it to the comments we were getting on Laura Lacoste, they were very concerned about the right of way with, uh, concerned about the number of properties. A big thing as part of this uh, grant is that it, once you, you get awarded the funds and you sign on, right, you have three years to get to construction. So if it takes longer than three years, which when you start working with multiple property owners and you run into utilities and other issues, it could move past that three year mark. Um, with the bridge, we're working with two properties, albeit one is the Texas Historical Commission, um, but from what I hear, they're very supportive of the project as well. We actually have a letter of support from them. They're very excited about this. As long as we can do it, something that supports that, they would actually um, eat into their parking lot uh, because you would lose, I think, two spaces. Uh, but I've been working with, uh, with our folks here and with um, their chief engineer who's gotten us uh, letters of support from the Texas Historic Commission. They'll be involved with this process, uh, making sure that we're doing it correctly and, and making sure that they're doing their part to support. I have a question. The replacement bridge, I know it's not exactly like that, 
but are we going to have a two phase like this? We had a, an iron structure on the left, a short one, and then the yeah. main structure on the right. There's actually three sections of this yeah. you can okay, can't totally tell. Actually, Leroy, there. let's go into the next one. That's okay. what the original one looked like. Okay. Yeah. So we're going to try and get it as close as possible, you know, um, right. within with st while still making it affordable, right? Okay. So we're going to look at a couple options. One is a prehab prefab option um, that our structural engineers will will work with them to get it as close as we can. Another option is through TxDOT. They have a Texas Historic Bridge Program, and there's actually two or three historic bridges that are actually available that could be reused. There's also some funding set aside for that reuse process, but we won't know until we get into it, right? So we have to dig in and see, are they the same length? Is, you know, maybe we could use part of it and then the other part we, we construct around it. Um, but that's part of what this process, these next six weeks, because we have six weeks to pull this all off. Um, so we can get it back to you for approval and then we have to submit before June 5th. So we have a limited resource. Uh, on this and we're gonna have to deal with what we find so yes yes but we're gonna try and get it as close we know how important that aspect is to the Texas Historical Commission so I mean that's the goal right to, to make it as close to this as possible Councilman Dyer you had a question where are we gonna get the hundred and fifty thousand dollars to pay them so that would come out of our general fund is it, is it in the budget now it is not currently in the budget so this we would have be a to budget. take it from something else we would take it from the fund balance, the unrestricted fund balance that is okay. not yet committed. Of which, what is our current fund balance uh, overage? Four, oh. Well, the total is like 4.8, 4.9? 4 4.8, 4 4.9 million. And okay. The second question is, uh, inflation is still going up. Uh, we've had a lot of bad experiences in the last two years with projects costing way more than they were planned. I think I heard you say for example, if this costs an extra million, we have to pay it. What's the contingency plan? How much are we going to put in it? Where are we going to get it? Yeah. Well, I think that the way, go ahead and yeah. describe how you. So that's an excellent point. One of the things that the feedback that we heard from TxDOT is, yes, this cost estimate is, we feel, too low, given current uh, rises in costs. So through this estimating process, we're going to try and get much closer. TxDOT also is allowing for a contingency, right? So there's a certain amount that we're allowed to put in there uh, to cover some of those increases. They're also providing a database now that gives us access to all their most recent uh, bid information, right? So what are things costing in real time? That's new to their system and something we'll take advantage of. But that's the whole goal for us for these next six weeks is to leave you in a really good situation because it's not gonna look good for our firm if you're in a situation where, yeah, you're stuck holding the bag for, for a ton of money. But that we're going to work towards that. And again, there is some amount that TxDOT's allowing for that contingency. So what are we going to vote on tonight? Just 150000 It would be to approve the, the initial um, uh, funding, or the initial funding, because uh, we have to do this uh, before we can actually get the, the, uh, the grant. Now, if something happens and we are not successful in this, which I think we've got a really, really good shot at it. I mean, a really good, substantially enough that I'm willing to, to um, kind of put my butt on the line for this. Um, You're going to write a check for the million dollars? No. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> I will put my reputation, which is a lot more valuable than my, uh, than my check is. <laughs> I just want to make sure that, I mean, I think it's a great idea. I'm, I support the idea. I think I agree with you. It looks like it's a very good possibility it'll happen. But I know when Scott comes in here in a few months and says, <clears throat> well, we have a slight overage. Uh, I want to know how much money are we going to put in. I don't think we should make it public. But I think there should be a discussion with the staff. And the city council should be informed. And we have to vote on putting that contingency money because it's going to have to come out of reserves. Right. So, so what will happen after this is if we are uh, successful with it, uh, then we'll come back with that item with a full cost uh, based on the estimation. What I'd really like to do is we'll do a, a if this is approved tonight, we get it uh, ready for submission um, because even if we submit it and if it comes back and it's too expensive for us to do it, even with the money that they're giving us, then uh, that we don't have to take it. I think that the best thing for us is to be, be informed 
as soon as they have that cost estimation with the contingencies, with the, uh, the timeline, so that, so that we can be very comfortable with uh, the fact that we are covered and won't have surprise overages, uh, then we'll bring it back at that point. Before and That would be in the next six weeks? You expect right. it would come What back? is the date that it's due? Um, it's due June 5th, but in order to be able to come back to council, we have to hit that second meeting in May, right? So that gives us about six weeks to work. Thank you. Great. Any other questions? It, I don't think you meant what you said. Um, I think everything we do needs to be open to the public. And um, but if we if we but we, we should have a, an open discussion on contingencies. Yeah. I mean, well, I think his I think his point was that. Um, you don't want it to have yeah. somebody come back and bid the yeah, contingency into the price. you don't want to put your contingency out there for the bidder to know about, <laughs> do you? Right. No. Um, well, it's going to be competitively bid. And so, yeah. 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 Okay. I, I got what you were saying well, with that. I, I, I agree with you that we don't want to keep secrets that shouldn't be secret, but not everything the city does is public mm. yeah. for reasons. But and all I'm saying is yeah. if there's valid reasons why it wouldn't be public, then we would have to... Follow those instructions. That's all I'm saying. Absolutely. Yep. Yes. Thank yeah. you for clarifying that. That's good. Yeah. Um, no, if someone related to this, I've, I've been asking many people this question: Do we spend this money for this? Because it is a lot of money, and it's not guaranteed. And someone this morning said, you know, at some point in time, someone's going to build that bridge, and so we don't get this grant. Somewhere in the future, this bridge will be built because it just makes so much sense. So this isn't a waste of money. Maybe we design it now, but we don't get it. Well, 10 years from now, we may build a bridge and the plans aren't going to change. Well, and the thing is, it's, that's exactly right. So even if we don't get selected this time around, this program comes out every two years. You can resubmit again in two years. We're also exploring other grants that might be a good fit. For a project like this so I, I don't think uh, it's wasted effort uh, and it does set you up for the future and it's a really neat looking project we would love to work on it I wanted to say we can't we can't really move forward without taking this initial step yeah we, were, we don't have a foot to stand on unless we have a plan so I think the plan is absolutely necessary and this has been brought up multiple times in the past this is going to be a multi-million dollar bridge and I don't want to pay for it. <laughs> Yeah. millions of dollars towards something like this but if we can get that um, the the grant from TxDOT then I think it's a phenomenal thing all right further discussion I don't know Linda Linda Vela V-E-L-A oh, thank you thank you all right so uh, I think the motion I'm looking for is to authorize task order number three with quiddity as described in an amount not to exceed one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So moved. Okay. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. You got to move faster. You gotta, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no. 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 I have a motion by Councilman Thank Carey, you. a second by uh, Councilman King. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed. Motion passes. Great. Thank you, Linda. Thank you. I appreciate all your hard work. I know it's been a lot. You really helped us through this. Okay, so uh, the next item is discussion and appropriate action on Simple City Task Order for UDO uh, Preparatory Analysis. Uh, and we have uh, Matt. Sorry, Matt Lewis. Yeah, come on up. That's Matt Lewis. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor. Council. I've got the wrong glasses on. Here we go. That's why I can't see. Hi. <laughs> hey. Good evening, Mayor, City Council. Matt Lewis with Simple City Design. Um, tonight we are, uh, have before you all what we call a DNA analysis. <clears throat> it's the uh, physical and numerical uh, values that make up Castroville. And what we do is we go in and study these patterns that are on the ground. We study the lots, the blocks, the building heights, the window orientation, the setbacks from the street, the turn radiuses of the blocks, how wide the streets are. All of these characteristics are what make up your town. It's the places that you know, the places that you love, but also um, oftentimes those are abstract standards. As you prepare to write your development ordinances and update your uh, standards, 
these standards can be used to inform your standards going forward so that when uh, new developments coming to town, you can say, well, here are some development standards that emulate what Castorville is. And uh, what we do is we capture these and put them in a range of standards for you so that you actually fully understand and can appreciate the environment that you've got on the ground today. So as new development comes forward, you don't have arbitrary rules and uh, regulations that are governing them don't, that are not yielding what you're looking for. Just looking at your regulations that you've got today, your lot standards don't match what you've got on the ground. They seem they could have been adopted from anywhere, America, and uh, it's not creating the patterns of Castroville. And you're starting to see these transformations as growth occurs, and um, you are requiring what you're getting. You don't have a lot of zoning standards. You've got someone sexually oriented businesses, but that's about it. And you've got a, a planned unit development district that allows you to write development standards as development occurs. But right now you're writing willy nilly standards based off of what's typical uh, development patterns. And so you're getting very conventional um, types of developments because of what you're requiring them to do. What this is going to do is provide you that toolkit that has every numerical value that you've got on the ground today. Um, this will talk to you about lot patterns, where your buildings sit on the lots. We're even gonna extract the, um, the variation. So we'll find the closest building to the street, the smallest lot, the building furthest from the street, the largest lots. So we can find this full wide spectrum of patterns that are present in Castroville so that when you start proceeding with your development standards, you understand exactly the development standards that you have that make up the place that you live in. So it's a quick brief summary of, uh, of the exercise. We call it a DNA analysis. Um, just like the DNA of humans, these are the physical components that make up your community. It's the daily um, experiences that you see. Um, and so those are the elements that will be captured in this and then you can code those going forward, which ones uh, work and which ones don't work. You know, And some of the um, uh, trends shifted over time as technology shifted, but what we would argue is that the patterns that you have in your downtown are timeless, they're authentic, they were measured in Varus, which is a wagon wheel turn, and now we're, you know, uh, behind autonomous vehicles soon, right? And all of these technologies have shifted, but the fabric of your community is still intact and functioning in today's times, um, which they could have never anticipated at the time that they built this. These are really timeless, authentic places. So. So the reason that we're doing this, the next item that we're going to talk about is a uh, setting a date for a development agreement policy workshop. <coughs> We have some loose standards on our development agreements. Uh, we have what has been written into the Alsatian Oaks um, uh, development agreement. We have some other standards that were built into the MP Homes development agreement. There were some other ones that were built into the original cobblestone uh, development agreement. But each one of these, some of them uh, we, are, we have removed over time. It, some of them haven't been completely codified. Uh, in terms of this council going through and, and making sure that these are actually the things that we want. And so this is a chance for us to take, uh, we, we embarked on a journey of education last year. So it's taking that education. And what we had from last year were a lot of things, the people that would talk about things, uh, my brother calls them point outable. So you can point them out. You can say, I like this, I don't like that. But what the DNA analysis does is it makes them definable. And so you know exactly what you're talking about. You know exactly when the, where those points are. And the idea is to make this very, very clear for the developers that are coming in. We can't stop them and they're asking us what to do. And we have had three instances already where we've told people this is basically what we want you to do. And they've misconstrued it and they've built other things, they've designed other things and it kind of locks them into a place. And so uh, this is a chance for us to, to understand this is the foundation this is where we begin. We'll go through the next step would be the, um, the policy workshop for the development agreement policies. Uh, and those are the specific items that we're asking for, making sure that we have the things that we are demanding, the things that we are requesting, and the things that would be really, really cool if they would do. So it kind of separates that into those three different categories. And then following up with that, we'll be coming back next uh, council meeting to talk about the, the UDO, the full process. But this is kind of the foundation of that. And you have done this already in, uh, which cities have you done this for already? 
uh, we've done this in Bandera, Texas, Taylor, Texas, Bastrop, Texas, um, San Marcos, Texas. Um, we did this in uh, Hutto, Texas. Several central Texas. We, we, we focus in central Texas. We like towns that have small walkable grids like you all have. Um, and so we only pursue cities that actually have this foundation because if not, they don't match the style of uh, regulations or developments that we're trying to uh, accomplish. And so this is a, you all have the, the uh, foundational elements, probably almost uh, most pristine example that we've seen. It's just this perfect grid that was executed exactly as the original Castroville plan called for. And so um, the fabric is here and all your answers are actually on the ground already. We just need to understand those details so we can uh, convey them going forward. Yep. Questions? I've got a question. Let, let her go, go first. Please go ahead. Uh, I, I kind of take offense to willy nilly. Uh, <laughs> I think that Castroville has exerted a great amount of effort to find standards that were were fully approved. And I, I don't want to leave the impression. They were fully I mean, approved, yes. Alsatian Oaks yep. was fully approved. The city council bought into it five to zero. Yep. So it's not willy nilly. Uh, I understand what you mean, but I just don't think that we are that loosey goosey. But uh, I agree that this is going to be helpful. But I, I have a bigger question. This, this looks like we're beginning to put money into the UDO. Correct. And I've yet to see a budget from the city administrator or the finance officer that tells me what's UDO going to cost us. And we're, we're already in the process of piecemealing out money. It seems like we should see a budget for UDO. And you told us, not you, I think Scott said it at yep. a previous meeting, that this could be a two, three year process. So if we're going to be spending money for two or three years, I'd kind of like to get an idea how much we're going to spend and, and work that into, maybe this is a, a workshop topic as opposed to a topic for tonight because we really couldn't do anything about Absolutely. it. Absolutely. But so I'd just is... like to make the point, we're now entering action phase for UDO and we don't have a budget for UDO. So what we're doing right now, this was actually in response to uh, the, the current development agreement that we're probably going to be looking at next council meeting for uh, Flat Creek. And um, there was a lot of confusion. We had a discussion with them that uh, about some of the requirements that this, as, as we've gone through an education process and realized, um, a great example, realizing that you need to interconnect neighborhoods. You can't have a neighborhood that is fully all by itself, not connected anywhere except onto a main road because all we're doing then is we're burdening uh, ourselves with the cost of increasing that, increasing traffic on that, uh, that thoroughfare, uh, increasing the cost of maintaining that, and so by interconnecting it, it actually makes things, makes it better on us. So that, uh, those elements, they were not anticipating and they were confused by, even though we told them to go to the journey series and understand, we still didn't have those codified. And so this, this initial thing is, although it is prep work for the UDO, uh, it is really more because we have developers that are misunderstanding. It's gonna cost them money. It's gonna cost us money. It's going to cause us problems, and it is not being a good partner. I do like partnering with the developers. I don't like development. I don't want to cover up good farmland, but it's a fact. And so if we are not very clear with what we want, then they will build exactly what they want for their pocketbooks, for their uh, the brief time that they're going to be here. And most of them, I mean, honestly, the ones that we've talked to have been very good in my, uh, in my estimation. They've been very good partners, they've tried, they've asked us what we want, but they're still going to do what's best for them. So it's making sure that we have defined what is best for us in terms of those, those elements, about interconnections, about what does that parkland look like, about the uh, transportation, the, the walking, biking, other means of transportation that keeps them off of the highways. So this is really specifically to make sure that we are very clear with the developers on, the, uh, on all of the elements that are required that are requested, and that if they wanted to go an extra step, this would be something nice. The thirty-four thousand five hundred dollars. Where will it come from? Well, and that's my, where my question was because according to the cover sheet, 
It says source of funding, CIP planning funds. We're going to go back and modify the CIP, move some dollars around, come with it. Well, well and actually, then my, so I'm not doing my question yet. Just what, so we're saying, uh, so I want to know which department of the CIP is it going to be pulled from. Right. And, you know, so that this would make this a budget amendment. So this, I don't think, would be an, a budget amendment. We have approved, or we did approve, a task order for Simple City to do the Highway 90 um, investigation. Out of that, uh, you only spent, what was it, $15,000? $15, so we do have that on the budget right now. We could reallocate some of those funds and put it in here, so that, and we've already identified the source of those funds. Uh, and we are not spending any more on that at this point. Uh, and we'll go into more detail about that uh, when we talk about the developments with uh, TxDOT next meeting. Uh, but that would come out of that. That's what uh, Scott had proposed us to take it out of that. Out of the remaining $100,000 that's right. already been a budget. Exactly. And then we'll take that. As long that. as that's specified, I wouldn't object if that was, yes. if that was specified. So it's not on top of that. No, it's yeah. part of that money that we've already voted. Yep. Exactly. So, that, so it's part of that one and two task order, and we're not going to use all right. of Task order one and two only <laughs> used about 15,000, so you got about 100,000 left. Correct. And that's so we would use 34,500. Exactly. Yeah, so if, we, if that would have been on the cover page, that would have helped that a lot. That would have been helpful, yeah. Okay. okay. More questions? Only one, 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 one small point. Um, um, my my uh, background is land surveying, and I just wanted to edit the, uh, the declaration that the VARA was based on a wagon wheel. Uh, the VARA was <laughs> established by the uh, Commissioner of the General Land Office in 1836 as 33 and a third inches. Yes, sir. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, all right. And, and what is the circumference of a wagon wheel? Oh, who knows? <laughs> 33 that's, <laughs> Whenever we read the uh, old surveys, it, that's what it uh, measured out. Is one the VARA is still the standard unit of measure for the land in the state of Texas, by the way. That's pretty amazing. That's too. wild. <laughs> Love that history. Thank you, sir. And I, pardon my statement, sir. I was not re referring to your development agreements. I was referring to your actual ordinances, uh, your subdivision ordinance. So yes. pardon that statement as well. And that, that, on, on that point, uh, UDO is probably one of the primary reasons that I wanted to sit at this chair. So it's a big project. Yes, sir. And we will talk more about that in, uh, in, at the end of this meeting. We'll talk about uh, that as an upcoming item. Uh, so we'll we'll kind of walk through that. Um, questions, comments. No. All right. So do I have a motion then to uh, what is this? Move to authorize a task order with Simple City as described in the amount not to exceed thirty four thousand five hundred. Second. Great. Any further discussion? I think we should specify and amend it to state that it's coming out of the out of the money that's already been approved for task order one and two. All right. Are you willing to modify? Yes. And I'm amenable. Great. Any further discussion? Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. Look forward to working with you all. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Likewise. You. Thank you both. We've got some really good partners here. I really, that's amazing. Okay, so the next item is uh, discussion and appropriate action on setting a date for development agreement policy workshop. Um, so this is uh, what we were just talking about. Um, so Scott put in some additional item, uh, and this was some back and forth where they were talking about some of the different things that uh, that are required. Uh, if you got a chance to read through those, that's really the questions came up because of that. If you look back in, um, we had talked. Last year, I think this was actually ratified the guiding principles um, in terms of how we're approaching development agreements, uh, and then some of the uh, some of the items that he had put in here about the elements of the development agreement uh, policy, and so uh, so basically the idea is to set something that is is as soon as practical, so that we can sit down and work through what was uh, what was given as our requirements for Alsatian Oaks, uh, what we had agreed to with uh, all of the subsequent development agreements, uh, because, and look at how they had changed, look at what we've learned over the last year to determine uh, which parts of that we want to incorporate, uh, look at the DNA analysis 
um, that will be uh, developed out of here and determine what, uh, I think it was um, Vince uh, Michael from the San Antonio Historic, um, or San Antonio Conservation Society, he said, determine what out of your past you want to have in your future, and so we would incorporate that as well. So, me, Mayor, were we given a time frame on the DNA analysis? How long will that take them to complete? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Because we're getting, you're fixing to get into a discussion to have a workshop. Right. right. So we need to make sure that that happens afterward. Yes. When um, would that be complete by? So we are kicking it off um, immediately, and then we think we can have it done by June. Um, there are dates in here. Let me pull this real quick. So we are uh, planning on doing a public introduction uh, in mid to late June. Is what we're, we're saying. Is that process uh, culminate into an all or nothing, or can you feed information as? Generally, we would compile the entire report so that we can break down all these elements because okay. we get into the natural environment. So it goes from ranges from the natural environment to the built environment, from your rural environments to your most urban environment. So we break down all your environments. We like to assemble all of it prior, but um, and so we, we're going to work as quickly as possible uh, to get this extracted. So your recommendation? Oh, I'm sorry. I, well, I was going to continue just, that. I, I, I was just. It's a really great point. It, it sounds like mm -hmm. that information would be pertinent to. Or, yep. Almost, we almost have to have it before we actually dwell into a UDL yeah. workshop, right? Yeah. Well, so I guess that that is one of our challenges because we have another development agreement that's coming up, and we kind of, I think that we should probably have at least a portion of that conversation specifically for that. So, on uh, doing the workshop, would it be prudent to break it into two sections? One would be the the foundation of that based on what we already know. Uh, and then do a follow-up um, and look at revision based on the DNA analysis? Yes, sir. I mean, you could do that. And, uh, so we can get the big picture items and then get the, the uh, details, the actual individual standards at the second one, if that's something that would be advantageous for you all. If you guys would be open to that, I think that would be, I know it's a little bit extra work for you, but uh, I don't want to let one more development agreement go without making sure that everybody here has had a chance to weigh in on that and do that collectively? Would you be open to that? Yes. Okay. What, what date were we? <laughs> Go ahead. Well, no, I was going to say, I put you uh, three calendars in there, but Scott, before he left, he was recommending doing it at the next council meeting before the meeting, come in a, t a couple hours ahead of time if you could, uh, and have the work session on the 25th, uh, possibly. That's the one I'm missing. Oh, that's right. That's right. You just told me that. I'm sorry. Uh, now, if that's not feasible, uh, could we do it? Maybe I've got his schedule to where he kind of knows when he's going to be here. Could we uh, do it? When he, when are you leaving? But um, uh, let me check. Okay. And the next week, I believe the mayor and Phil is out. So, yeah. uh, Leroy said that he did just text in. He's watching uh, to see if we could possibly do it the next meeting. But he did not realize that uh, Mr. Carey was out. Okay. And when um, you I'm, I'm heading out uh, Sunday through Thursday for that. And then Friday and Saturday I'm at the, uh, in Austin at the Surveyors Association. So basically I'm out for a week. Okay. Would we want to look at doing next week on Friday? I'm not here. My son's graduating OCS. Oh, that's awesome. When are you leaving for that? Uh, flying out ODARC 30 Wednesday. Okay. So we're going to miss that. And y'all are out the first week of May. We're out the first week of May. And then we have a council meeting on the 9th. <laughs> so. Well, so then. I'm open on the 8th. We can do it on the 8th or on the 9th. You want to do it on the same day? I'll that pushes us. Legit, on <laughs> <laughs> well, we're swearing people in on the 9th. And so. So a light. A agenda. lot of times we don't have huge things, but that is the swearing in ceremony. Well, we okay. could do it. We could get early and do it before the council meeting. Yeah, let's get in. Let's plan on doing it. Are you guys all right with doing it on the 9th? Yeah. And we'll come in early. We'll figure out what that needs to look like. I am. Okay. What time? He had suggested a couple hours ahead of time, so I'm assuming somewhere around 3, uh, maybe, in that way you, what do you do think a that, little time. What do you think that time frame looks like? Yeah, that works. Is, is that, can, is that can, a 3-hour, 4-hour? I mean, 
<laughs> three to four hours would be advantageous. <laughs> okay. To really Some get yeah. Yeah, because we need to break so that we can get ready for the council meeting at 5:30. Mm -hmm. We want okay. to schedule it for Monday. Would you rather do it Monday? We text Scott, Scott just in case to make sure that was good with his okay. schedule. I have work scheduled, but I can work around that. On, but if y'all uh, Tuesday, Tuesday, okay. Tuesday. Okay. Yeah, I think it's probably safer if we do it on Monday. Well, okay. if we want to make it a bigger, a bigger chunk of time on Tuesday, I can work around that. So. Okay. So. Uh, either either one of those. Preference things. either way. Either one. Well, Scott, have a preference either. He's texting right now. Okay. Well, why don't we? Oh, he said um, May 9th could work. Okay. Well, our. May 9th at probably noon. Yeah. Okay. Feed you. Okay. <laughs> Feed you twice. Okay. Okay. Sure that works okay for you? Works. Yep. Okay. Okay. Great. Okay. Uh, I don't think we need, a, we don't need a motion on that, do we? Um, That's just scheduling. I'm sorry, I don't remember if I have a, I do have action for it. Yeah, I move to set 9 May. As the date for a council workshop to discuss and identify development standards. Mm -hmm. That's what you got here. May not uh, no. Well, no. and uh, David, are you able to make it during the day, or is it better for you? Because I want to make sure that you have a chance to attend that. Uh, so I, I can. In the evening, Monday would work better, but I can take off after the afternoon. Okay. He has to get all gussied up until he gets sworn in that day. Gussied. <laughs> all right. Are you guys, are you open to doing it Monday instead? Okay, let's do Tuesday. <laughs> if you're okay with that, we'll do Tuesday. Yeah. Noon or one? I'll, pro I'll provide you some, a meal. <laughs> There's a difference between noon and one. Yeah, noon would be better. It gives us more enough time. Noon. Instead of rushing. I've got a number. All right. And I'm sorry, who seconded that motion? Do I have a motion? Anyone? I did. I did the motion. Okay. Do I have a second? I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. Okay. All right. Next item. Fun. We're going to hang out. <laughs> uh, next item is discussion and appropriate action on authorizing the city administrator to reimburse Bradford Bain for pivot cost in the, the amount of $61,410 as per contract dated 20, uh, January 25th, 2013. Um, I, we walked through this last uh, council meeting. Uh, unless Leroy had any more to add, uh, add to it, uh, I believe that, uh, that our uh, city attorney had taken a look at that with our, uh, do you want to talk about that conversation that you had with uh, Scott and what you guys determined? Let me turn that on. <laughs> Press that little button to turn green. Um, so yes, Mayor, I did have an opportunity to review the contract itself, um, some of the background materials, and some of the correspondence that took place in and around the time that the contract um, was being developed. And you know, I uh, reviewed Scott's analysis, and though uh, I don't come up with the same analysis, I do come up with the same conclusion. And the bottom line is, uh, there were certain conditions that both parties needed to have met and certain things that needed to have taken place to have triggered the payment um, to the banks. And what I would suggest is that neither party really followed through with all of that. But the long and short of it is that, um, you know, based on analysis and review, the payment is due. Great. Any so, questions about that? So you We're, said $61,410? Because all the p document in front of us <laughs> says sixty-one thousand four hundred. Um, the item says sixty-one four. Yeah, the item it, just says sixty-one four ten. But, yeah. that but the cover out. sheet says sixty-one four. So I'm just making sure. <laughs> well, well, it may be what we had in the last meeting, and that I, I may, I may have added ten bucks. <laughs> but that may be what we spoke of. Ten dollars interest. <laughs> Are we liable for All right. any interest? Uh, no. uh, Are we liable for any interest? The contract call did not call for any interest on any payments. So that'll be a total payment, one-time payment. Yes, sir. Yes. Second question is where are we going to get the money? To be out of the utility fund reserve. Out of the reserves? Or uh, under utility? Yes. 
So the motion is If you'd to like to not exceed that number we have in the line item, the tender. Well, I think that exactly. the motion is to authorize the city administrator to reimburse Bradford Bain $61,410 for the pivot system described in the city's contract with the Bains dated January 25th, 2020, uh, 2013. I'll make that motion. I'll second it, and, and thank you for your patience. Yeah. <laughs> oh, he's here. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Any further discussion? No. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passes. <laughs> thank you for that donation. Thanks, Bradford. And, and sorry that that didn't happen. Thanks for following up on it. Uh, next item. Uh, so this one is, uh, I'm going to read it out. Uh, this is uh, Councilman Dyer's uh, item. So discussion and appropriate action on adopting a policy authorizing the city administrator to contract for appropriate commercial janitorial services for all operational park and recreation restroom facilities to supplement park staff members as needed for uh, extraordinary park patron usage events and to appropriately raise rental fees as shown in the uh, FY23 comprehensive fee schedule to recover the additional maintenance cost for the public facilities. So I'll hand this off to Councilman Dyer. Well, I appreciate that you put it back on the agenda because I wasn't here last time. Sure. Uh, I think uh, City Council has an obligation to give the city staff what they need to be successful. And uh, I personally, have observed a recurring problem in the park system cleaning restrooms I think I think it is a real problem I don't think we have enough staff on the city staff to be able to accommodate these large busy weekends when we're having tournaments or some special occasion so I think a policy is needed and that's why I put this policy forward and uh, I, I would make a motion to uh, create the policy as the mayor read it, and uh, that way we give the city administrator the flexibility. Should he believe he needs it, he can go hire additional personnel to supplement the city staff when he feels it's necessary. Okay, I have a motion to approve as read. Do I have a second? I'll second. Okay, any discussion? Yes. Okay. I guess what we're asking is, we're asking the city administrator to look into the cleaning issue of the bathrooms. And because like right now we have, Deborah, correct me or inform me, we, I know we have a cleaning contract on this building. Mm -hmm. We must have a cleaning contract on the Steinbach house. Mm -hmm. Well, that one we do not. The lady that, that works there does, she, she took over the it. clinic because she preferred doing it. Is the, the cleaning contract we have now, is it just this building? No, and the it's, bathrooms out back? No, it's public works. Public works? Uh, also, the, the police department. Police department. Mm -hmm. okay. What about the library? The library. The library. The library. So we have all these different cleaning contracts around. Is that, but I think maybe, you know, in my mind, do, do we have another cleaning contract, or do we incorporate all these into one cleaning contract, and then you start looking at the cost of that versus maybe if you look at that versus plus the bathrooms, um, that maybe we need to have a city staff to do nothing but just clean all the city facilities instead of having some contracted and some not contracted. But this is, in my mind, this is something we throw back to Scott and say, you know, look at this for us and come back and tell us. And we're getting close to budget season now. And I think from what I understand and talking to Scott and everybody else, they understand our concerns about the cleanliness of the bathrooms in this. So I think that put them on the radar of what we're looking at. But I think the, the time we look at this is really in the budget thing. But it can't just be, oh, at the last minute kind of thing. It needs to be looked at you know, not not just the bathrooms at the park, but the bathrooms everywhere, all the city facilities. So does that mean we hire a people to do that, or do we? Because to me, it makes no sense to have some subcontracted 
some not, some through one contract and others through others. But but again, that to me that comes in the budget cycle. It might be just looking at it. I understand your and I agree with your points. Oh, we've got we've got really 19 park facilities when we get the new restroom delivered, which is coming yeah, soon. There's 19 park facilities that have restrooms in them. You have two people on the park staff. It's not enough. Now, uh, I, my motion doesn't even discuss the rest of the city. This is just about parks. And, and uh, we know that the lady who currently works in the Steinbach house prefers to clean her restroom herself. So that takes us down to 18. Still too many for two people to clean. So uh, I, if you want to take up the issue in the coming budget about consolidating them, that's fine. But right now, uh, we're in, let's see, Jennifer, we're in the third quarter of this year. So if we, if we adopt this policy, if the city administrator chooses to do it, then he's going to have to make some minor adjustments in his uh, the fee schedule in order to compensate for this additional cost, not without regard to what they're paying for the rest of the building, just for park building. Okay. So I'm just suggesting for our discussion, we're really talking about the rest of this fiscal year and then a, an adjustment, if Scott chooses to use it, to put a little bit more money in the budget using charges to the park users. Great. Further discussion? Yeah. Um, and Phil, in regards to like the people, you know, that we have two people on parks. They're being utilized to do other things, not That's parks. Right. So I don't know if it's a mismanagement of, from, of, of using, utilizing them when we... They, I, I would be careful about stating I, mismanagement. I don't Yeah. Know. Okay. So, uh, misutilizing them instead of using them for their primary duties um, but I mean they're getting inundated and I see it every day so if that's they're being reprioritized how about that I don't think it's mismanagement I think that uh, I, I just want to be very careful we'll, we'll just disagree on that one fair enough because the your priority is different from my priority on some things and it's it's all opinion so we'll just agree to disagree but however their primary duty, their job description, is parks and rec. And they're being sent to do other things outside of parks and rec. So that's where, if, if we're going to utilize our people appropriately, yes, and they're getting inundated. Because people are approaching them of, why aren't you doing your job taking care of the parks? And I don't disagree with you at all, but, but what we're, we're, we're authorizing the city manager to contract for cleaning services mm -hmm. for the parks. Mm -hmm. We should be looking at all of our cleaning. Yeah, so devolved it down to one contract. That I agree with. That's but not, we and also that's not then, outside of this motion. Yeah, and, and so to me the motion is let Scott come back to us as a plan what he thinks about should we contract that out or do we need to hire more? If we hire staff and do away with these cleaning contracts, you know, he's always talking about efficiency. That may be the most efficient thing. You know, what the office building I work at. We don't contract out for cleaning services. We hire a person who cleans all the buildings because that's far cheaper and it's a big building. But we should limit to him in this that we're saying you need to contract out for this. I think what we need to let Scott know is come back and give us your plan on what you think would be the best way to move forward. But we had a contract for this and we were told by Devin and that, hey, my people can handle the cleaning, let's get rid of this contract. And so we did. And it's not happening. And I think if we let Scott know that, that now if you need told to come back tell us but don't just let it park separately from these buildings oh, yeah. because this is a substantial contract so we sat down um herb and scott and i sat down and we talked through uh, herb came up with some really good points um and as scott dug into it um and as he went and looked at it um he noticed that no they they're not being taken care of so 
not to the level that we're expecting. The problem is, I've said this a million times, if you aim at nothing, you're likely to hit it. And right now, we're aiming at nothing. And we don't have restroom standards. So if you say, I want to hire this many people, then what are, they, what are we actually trying to accomplish? What we're missing, to me, the strategic part of it is defining what we're trying to hit, defining where we're missing. So more of the conversation, well, let me finish real quick. Uh, so more of the conversation uh, as we started digging into this, I mean, it was a very productive conversation uh, because Scott said, first, we don't have standards, so we don't know exactly what we're trying to accomplish. Second of all, um, there, are, uh, there are times that it needs to be cleaned, that it's not being cleaned because uh, it's happening in, half hour, uh, in off hours, in the evenings, mm -hmm. on the weekends, uh, when the staff isn't currently working and having to bring them in. And if you looked, they were working their butts off over Easter. Mm -hmm. And so trying to get them in for all of these times when we're really going to need them, I think that there is going to be a need for some augmentation. But I do believe that if we get, so the, the need there is real. The fact is we are not meeting the need right now. We have also not defined what that need is. So we can't determine what, uh, what the actual solution is to make that happen. I think we can make recommendations. I also believe, and this is where we have differences of perspective on this, I believe that saying, I want you to go and accomplish this and do it this way, that is, to me, that is tantamount to uh, directing staff. And I think that, that our job is to say, we believe that we are not achieving what we're trying to achieve. We would like you to come back and, um, and make a proposition on what are our cleaning standards. We can then evaluate the cleaning standards, and if they can't meet it with the current staff, then the natural extension of that is that they would have to augment staff, have to find the, um, the funds to do that with. But it's just, to me, making a motion like this is getting too much into the daily operations and telling them how to accomplish things without telling them what to accomplish. And so I think that we're stepping over the actual resolution to try and get to something that, um, that is really in the realm of operations management. And that's. Uh, again, the need is real, and the fact that, that Councilman Dyer pushed on this to make sure that it happened, he brought some things to light that uh, were absolutely true. I went in there for uh, for tour to Castroville, and there was my wife had to go and get the soap out of the, the women's restroom and bring it over to me because the soap dispen dispenser was gone. When I, uh, when I when I say we're creating a policy, I don't believe we're telling the city administrator how to do this. I think we're simply empowering him through the policy and he would perform this duty like any other. If he's going to hire somebody, he's going to have to write an RFP and define what he wants done and how he wants it done and when he wants it done before he can hire somebody. I mean, that's not our job on the city council, that's his job. All I'm interested in doing is passing a policy that that enables him to go do that and and I don't want to get in the weeds I really don't care how he does it I don't even care if he does it it's his choice mm -hmm. but at least we've given him a tool that he can put in his toolbox and if he feels he needs it he can exercise that doesn't he already have that tool though if if we're not accomplishing a service that we're providing, that we're supposed to be providing, the things that we uh, are responsible for providing, because that's that's what we do, he has that tool. If he if if he knew that uh, we had a certain standard for cleanliness, and um, to me the the policy really is uh, having them uh, having staff define what the policy is, having us review what the policy is, and agree on it, and say, well, maybe you're missing this, maybe you're missing that. And for me, it is that he already has the ability to recommend outsourcing versus insourcing. And to me, it, I think it is them coming back. And this is, this is my Remember, it's not a dichotomy. It's not one or the other. Right. It's, we're saying he can supplement the staff. Because right. the job descriptions for the city staff do not contain the words clean the restrooms. Those words do not exist in those job descriptions. And I've, I have voiced my concern about that and recommended that we should consider 
tightening those up a little bit to try to make sure we're describing to a prospective employee what their job really will be. Uh, but that's a separate issue. I just, in tonight I'm just interested in can we agree on a policy? That's all I want to have. And I, I Thank agree you for your time. I agree with a policy. I just I, I don't fully agree with what uh, the definition of that policy. I I would agree with it if you added on to there that we want to develop. Um, and mind you, I don't get a vote, so uh, <laughs> I'm just telling you what what I believe. I think that if you added on to there the um, requirement to bring back a uh, for council approval a policy on cleaning the restrooms in the different areas when they're going to be done, how we're going to augment uh, during these heightened periods or off hours or weekend hours or whatever. Uh, I, I think that that would make me feel a lot more comfortable. But I, I get where you're trying to go with this. OK. What That's was the process in the past when these other contracts were? The same people that clean our buildings now yeah. had a contract for the, the park. And they based on I want to say it was once a day. And but then on, I mean, how did how were those contracts? Derived? Who made that decision? Uh, originally, at the was that administrators? We put it in the said? budget when I first came here. They okay. accidentally took it out of the budget. So for three years, the staff here, me and two other girls, cleaned this building. Right. Everybody had to clean their own building. It was interesting. <laughs> <laughs> was that in your job suppose. description? But we did it. We did it. Uh, but then uh, we put it back in the budget, of course, and then we we, con we did an RFP. And uh, ha because originally they had a lady, I, let me go back. There was a lady originally that was cleaning the buildings when I came here. I never met her, and she didn't come in. And so I'm not saying that if we hired someone individually, they wouldn't do that. Uh, you tend to have more issues if they don't have enough people, because these buildings do take quite a what? Quite a length of time, mm -hmm. just the buildings. And so then we, we did contract out. Jana King is our contracted uh, service. And uh, so we've had them ever since. Uh, I do believe uh, when this first was brought up, I believe um, Mr. Dixon did talk to the gentleman that is with Jana King and said, you know, we may want you to bid these again. Because when they bid this out, they bid it by square feet. And so, and depending on as far as the park, because uh, they did do the trash pickup, they cleaned the RV area and all. Uh, it would depend on how often you want to pay them to come out. I know they were contracted on a separate thing, I want to say, on the large Easter, that type of thing. And they would come out and clean. But it, it's a huge, huge undertaking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Our park is very nice, but it's very big. And so, um, with the lady at one point that cleans our building, of course she cleans the restroom, also cleaning Lions Park uh, up until they had, uh, you know, we hired someone in uh, under the park. Now when they were hired in under the park, I know originally you were talking about their job descriptions. It was part of it to do maintenance on the buildings. Uh, so, but that was kind of both at first. Uh, so, it, but it gets hard when you only have, say you're down two people mm -hmm. and it becomes spring and you have to mow. So, thanks. I don't know if that helps any, but uh, uh, Councilman Kerry, conversation. Uh, yes, I I think that one of the most important phrases in this uh, item is as needed for extraordinary park patron usage and events, and I think that that's a very limiting uh, uh, aspect of this uh, of this item, and I support uh, moving this. I think that the the cleaning procedures, timing, everything else is a separate issue. I think that uh, that will be handled as need be, and uh, I think that this will come back to us uh, when when there is a budgetary item presented for it. Great. All right. So I have a motion and a second. Any further conversation? Right. I guess I, I'm, I'm still confused all this because this is the way I read this is we're authorizing the city administrator to contract. For services. However, I guess to me, we, in my mind, so what we're telling them, go hire. Not, not if he thinks he needs it. You're saying go hire. Okay. But if 
the more important thing is, I think, is we should have Scott come back and tell us how is he going to handle it. And we don't have another major thing coming up for a couple of months. But I think he needs to come back and tell us how does he intend to handle the cleaning of the buildings and all the park facilities, all the city facilities. Let him come back and tell us what he thinks it needs to be. If, it, if we need to extend, extend, uh, expand our current contract with Janet King, so be it. He can tell us that. If he thinks we need to do away with the contract with Janet King and hire full-time cleaners for the city, I mean, that's a budgetary guy. He can, you know, they, they, he and the staff can figure that out. But I think, to me, I think we should leave it open to him to come back and tell us quickly how he wants to handle this issue. I think we're going to see that during the budgetary process. Well, if, if, but if we don't want to wait for that, if we want to do it before that, so be it. But I don't think we need to go out and hire, expand, you know, Janet King or anybody else. We'll hire somebody right now for a very short duration. I don't think this is right now. I think this is as needed for extraordinary park patron usage and events. And if we don't have one of those, then there's nothing authorized here other than to seek additional supplemental staff for for extraordinary park based patronage and usage events. So I think so it's a limiting but are we aspect. telling him to do it. Yes, we're telling him to do it but with limiting and a limited aspect. All right. Any further discussion? A motion and a second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Opposed. Motion passes. All right. Thank you. Good discussion, folks. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. It, you know, I, I firmly believe it is okay not to agree on everything. Um, and I, I appreciate the fact that we can do that most times very respectfully, and uh, that's part of the process. That's why there's five of you. That's why I don't get a vote. That's why uh, one, of, one of my favorite phrases is if you all think the same thing all the time, somebody ain't thinking. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. All right, great discussion. Uh, next item is discussion on future agenda items. Um, so is there anything that, that we have missed on the uh, on the pending reminding you please make sure that you get them onto the pending agenda items uh, submit the uh, the, the uh, item worksheet it's just really helpful uh, like what Herb had done with this councilman Dyer had put on what his, uh, his his documentation on it the recommended motion please make sure that you complete that um, the next uh, I think on the next one, we're going to be talking about some of this will be in the uh, mayor's report. Some of it will be as individual items. We're going to talk about our progress with TxDOT. We've been doing a lot of stuff with TxDOT. We've learned a lot over the last couple of months and had tons of interaction with them. And um, we'll talk about the legislation day, uh, the legislator day that was in Austin. Uh, talk about kind of furthering that with the city coordination with the the local with the county, with the state, with the federal, about the upcoming trip to uh, DC. So we'll go over some of that stuff. Uh, we'll talk about, uh, we've had some really great examples of per public servants in Castroville, and I don't wanna spoil that, but there are a number of different uh, items on there. I wanna make sure that we're highlighting the people that are doing these kinds of things, volunteering and giving up their, their, themselves to better the city. Um, we will, most likely have the item about the UDO. Uh, part of that, I'll, I'll uh, recommend that you go and take a look at some of the uh, other cities that have done this, because we have to scope that out. So it'll be a, a full scoping exercise to talk about. There's a bunch of different elements. Um, you can go good, better, best. You can do like the full boat. You can do a meme. So we'll make sure that you've got all that information uh, and we'll get some information out ahead of time so that you can do some research. Uh, we will most likely have another development agreement uh, and uh, we are going to be talking, I don't know if it's next week, but very, very soon, um, I would say in the next couple of meetings, we'll be talking about the water strategy, talking about our water rights, um, looking at the assets that we have, how are we, how we are leveraging those, how we're prepared for what is undoubtedly going to be uh, another drought season. Uh, so we'll be talking about that again. I don't think it's this next one, but it's going to be within the next few. Um, is there anything else that I've missed? Yeah, I know the uh, the contractor for the River Bluff is supposed to brief us. Uh, that according to what Tom and them told me, uh, is supposed to brief us at the next meeting. 
because they're, they're looking at kicking off in May. River Bluff. So. Yeah, we need to make sure, and that, um, I think, I was talking to Scott about that, and I'm glad that you brought that up. Um, I, he was saying we'd probably do it in the city council meeting, do the, because we talked about, uh, we had actually committed to doing a town hall before yes. we began. Um, oh, before we began? Well, before the actual like implementation, so yes. that people knew exactly what to expect. We knew what the communications plan was. He was talking about doing that in the council meeting, and I think that is the next council meeting. Um, do you want to do it as a separate, specially called meeting, or do you want to do that uh, during the council meeting? As long as there's enough room in here for everybody in River Bluff to come in. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm just telling you. Well, there was last time. We didn't have it during a city council meeting, though. No. But we had it in here and yeah. there was plenty of space. Do you yeah. think that we're gonna need more? With all the homes in there, everybody's gonna be affected. In okay. In the phases. In the phases, yeah. Yeah, um, but I mean, either way, everybody's so, gonna be affected. What do you think? Uh, because the last time we, we actually didn't have that many that showed up. I mean, if we have to do it, if you feel like there's gonna be more showing up next time, we can maybe look at doing it at the Braden Keller if it's gonna exceed our capacity in here okay. We've got a pretty good capacity but I'll there's going to be a lot of questions mm -hmm. so if you don't want it to go into a late night I wouldn't overburden the agenda okay just my opinion so because there's going to be let's a look at doing especially called on that I'll work with um, Scott yeah because Scott told me it was going to be the beginning of May but this okay. but the city but they're supposed to brief City Council according to Tom and the contractor today at the next City Council meeting to say okay this is an overview and what have you this is where we're going to be staging our materials okay all that i'll work with you on getting that in i think that you're right i think we need to do it if they can if we can get staff uh prepped for that and ready for that ahead of time well they're the ones that are telling me so they should yeah. be prepped and ready perfect uh -huh. all right but so they we'll, haven't contacted us yet so. okay we'll make sure that we get that on uh, again that'll probably be especially called and um and we'll announce a potential uh quorum town hall just in case yep yeah. yeah. okay He's the top electrician. He runs the electrical department so for the city. For the city. He's yeah, a Tom Miller. Right. He's a lineman. He's a lineman. Electrician. Shame on you. He's in charge of the electrical guys. That's all I can tell you. He's the one that found the fried turkey. Oh no, that wasn't. Yes. <laughs> fried squirrel. Okay. So Anything last, else? Last council meeting, we also talked to the special to get together and come back with a discussion on code compliance and what our options. Okay. Make sure. Will you? Um, but if I need to do an agenda item, I will. But I thought that you would agree that he's going to. It's probably on our pending list because we do have an agenda pending list. Yeah. yeah. If you don't mind, just uh, can you work with uh, with Scott. Scott on that? Make yeah. sure that it's on the the list. Make sure we've got all the documentation for it. Yeah. Okay. And that way you can make sure also that he's covering everything that you want him to. And this is this is part of the the whole idea behind the list, uh, not just the list, but the uh, the actual sheet. And we can modify that sheet however it works well for you. But this is a good uh, way to have a conversation uh, to make sure that what, what Scott and staff comes back with is what you're actually trying to accomplish. Okay. Uh, anything else? Not here. We got it covered? All right. Wow, record time. All right. So we are through the agenda and adjourned at uh, 720. Mm -hmm. Wow. Way to go.